Good morning, Idaho. Hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this. Welcome to the Local Yokel Idaho podcast, where we talk about what is going on in the wonderful state of Idaho. Welcome back to the first episode of the podcast for 2024. Woo! Still going at it. As you can guess, we have a full show today with the Idaho legislature starting this last week and the winter weather we've been having. We have a lot to cover, not to mention we have a super interesting story that involves nuclear fallout in Idaho. What a wonderful start to the new year. Am I right? Hey, glad to have you here today. Please join us for the morning banter where we chat with you guys a little bit before we get into it. But I understand if you're short on time and prefer to skip the banner, you can use the timestamp that's in the description to jump straight over to the stories. For those that stayed, welcome back. Hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and New Year. I definitely had a wonderful Christmas. New Year's, that's a different thing, but we'll get into that later. Also, I hope you've been staying warm with the crazy winter weather we've been having. But before I get into any more stuff, John, the editor for the show, is co-hosting with me again today. Hey, Tyler. How you doing? I am doing way better than I was on New Year's. You alluded to that not too long ago, so I'm glad that better is there. Better is better. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both got sick over this Christmas, yeah? Yes, we did. And I swear, and I've heard it from other people, I'm still recovering. I, I, I still, it's been, I want to say like a week or two now. And don't worry, the whole reason that there wasn't a podcast last week wasn't because of me being sick. I was well enough to record, but that's a different thing we'll get into later in the banter. But I I definitely am still trying to get over to it. It's weird. My balance is like still off. So like I tried to sit there and be like, aha, I am well. I am going to go do errands. And so I drove and I ended up getting a horrible headache because of that, because my inner ear did not like me driving and doing the car and everything. (laughs) Huh. So I'm in the same boat. I've I've been dealing with some headaches too, and that might be related. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it it was just oh hello. I hit my mic. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> We're off to a wonderful start. Welcome to twenty twenty four. It will totally right. be way more normal than twenty twenty three or twenty twenty two or twenty twenty one or all the twenty year of this decade. It's been an interesting decade thus far. Anywho, besides the New Year's, how was Christmas for you? I know we haven't talked about it on here since last year. I can say that now. Yeah, no, Christmas was good. We hung out with family, just kind of chilled and hung out. It was great. I I enjoyed my Christmas. Sweet. I know. I definitely, because of the cold and other factors, (laughs) was able to get a lot of free time as well. And so it was really nice kind of to cap off the whole year with like, okay, cool. Take a pause from the podcast. Take a pause from the the rush of trying to get a show out every single week and trying to do work every single week and just kind of sit back and enjoy and look on the blessings that the Lord has given me. Yeah, it it's definitely good sometimes to stop. And that's a, you know, the the new year is a great time for that. For sure, for sure. Also, and maybe someone else out there can relate, but since starting the podcast and, you know, you're always on this every week where you're going and you're always looking towards the end of the week. The whole week is spent getting ready towards the end of the week when we record right and also for my job. So the whole week was like you, you started Monday and it was focused at the end of the week. And then once the end of the week came and you either hit you know, your mark or not or whatever, then it cycled over. Being in that life for a year or whatever, it goes fast. I, you know, I can remember as a kid being like, oh, life moves so slow. No, no. All you need to do is start looking at your life in weeks and man, it just, the seasons, everything clips by so quickly. Yep. Yep, it does. (laughs) You, You are absolutely right. Which is why it's so important to stop and to take uh, stock of account. the year as a past, yeah, take account, to look forward to the next year, what you want to do differently. I don't necessarily like New Year's resolutions, but I do like I do like looking back at last year and years past and thinking, well, what can I do differently this year? Or what things do I want my life to look like this coming year? Because if you have some of those ideas, then you start working towards those ideas, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. And so I think New Year's is a really good time for that type of recollection. Agreed. Oftentimes I'll have people ask me and they're like, hey, what are you doing for your New Year's resolutions or whatever? 
And if I know the person well enough, obviously, I'll usually look at them and be like, I'm doing resolutions all year long. I, I don't I don't try to wait for <laughs> the end of the year to make those. I, I like to constantly being like, okay, cool. I've achieved that thing. All right, next thing, next thing. I'm not going to wait for the end of the year to try to do that or something. I'm like, if you're constantly setting goals and achieving those goals and objectives, even if they're smaller and not as large as a New Year's resolution, you'll get far more done than the person that starts New Year's and they have these big dreams or whatever. And then, you know, February rolls around and nothing's happened. Very true. But in any case, the whole reason we didn't have a show last week wasn't, you know, it was partly due to sickness, but I was well enough to the show. It was more just because the news cycle, a lot of the news people, just like us, took off kind of the latter half of the year there to just kind of enjoy. And so it was like reruns of articles and things. And so when I had sat down to look at and get ready for the show last week, there was like one, maybe two things for the main show that I could find. And so we decided just to kind of skip last week. And so we're doing that this week. Because of that, this week may be a bit longer. So bear with us if you see a bigger timestamp. But hopefully that just means there's more quality and content for you all to enjoy. Which, speaking of which, in the nature of time and trying to stay on track, let's move into our first news story here. And like we teased earlier with our first news story here, winter weather disrupts item comes by several sources. As many of us know and have experienced, the winter weather has been sweeping across our state from DoorDash suspending operations due to severe blizzard conditions to power poles snapping under extreme winds. It has been an interesting week for Idahoans and the weather. Starting with the first one, DoorDash has activated its severe weather protocol. Ooh, spooky. Suspending operations across several areas in Idaho. This measure comes as a severe winter storm delivers potentially dangerous conditions, including heavy snow and strong winds. The affected areas include Idaho Falls, Pocatello, Twin Falls, Rexburg, and many others. DoorDash spokes person Julianne Crowley thanked the affected DoorDashers, merchants, and customers for their understanding during these difficult weather conditions. Meanwhile, Idaho Power reported that extreme winds in the Burley area snapped dozens of rural power poles. Wind gusts were recorded between 45 and 50 miles an hour, causing hazardous conditions over a good chunk of eastern Idaho. Idaho Power crews have been working tirelessly to repair the damage and restore power to affected residents. The National Weather Service has issued a winter storm warning and wind chilling warning for the weekend or past weekend, depending on when you're listening to this. Travel could be very difficult and impossible. The warning says dangerous cold wind chills are expected to be as low as 40 below zero in areas like Idaho Falls, Rexburg, St. Anthony, Victor, Ashton, Teutonia, and Driggs. Idaho State Police have partnered with local law enforcement agencies and the Idaho Department of Transportation are ensuring that they're out in force during the storm that could create extremely dangerous road conditions, you think? Captain Chris Wiedek with the Idaho State Police advised residents to decide if they really need to be driving during the storm or not. If they decide they need to travel, remember the roads are slick, the wind is fast, and there are more people on the road than just you. Lastly, a cold wave is bringing sub-zero temperatures to the region. The National Weather Service predicts temperatures minus 10 degrees on Friday, minus 14 on Saturday and minus 9 on Sunday and minus 6 on Monday. Officials are urging people to be prepared. Vista officials recommend having an emergency preparedness kit on hand at all times. Which, out of all those things, kind of trying to mash those up, there's a lot of snow and there's a lot of cold in Idaho and be careful, basically. <laughs> yeah, the thing that I will say, the thing that made me laugh is the recommendation is don't get out if you don't need to. And then here in the greater Boise metro area, you had Boise schools closed, but West Ada and Nampa were both open. And then later mm -hmm. in the week, we had Boise open, but then West Ada and Nampa were closed. So it's like, well, okay, cool. If you don't have to get out, you shouldn't. But who's who's making these choices as to which things stay open and which closed? That's It seems a little arbitrary. I, I thought that was funny. Yeah, it is funny. It really is. I know I am on the homeschool end of things. And so the public school side of things... I don't know as much about, but I did hear from some different families that they have their children go to a public school here on the west end of the valley. And I heard, we'll put it this way, Canyon County residents that go to public schools were a little bit up in arms about the whole thing. That like, wait a second, 
you got X amount of snow in Boise, you got all the snow here, and you didn't close down, and so what happened is that the school district was like, okay, fine, 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 we'll close tomorrow because we're going to get more snow, so they closed it everywhere else, but then Boise was like, eh, we're not, we didn't get as much snow as last time, so they were open, and so it causes this, like, weird, disjointed, uh-huh. just, the world of politics is fascinating. Yeah, that, that all definitely made me laugh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it also made me glad that I was homeschooled. <laughs> Yes, yes. So for all you that have to go to work and commute and all those different things, Godspeed to you. Thankfully, most of the snow seems to be falling on the weekend. So hopefully by Monday, all the crews will have gotten stuff cleared. And this next week for you should be reasonably nice for commuting. And you'll just have to deal with some really cold temperatures. But, you know, that's Idaho for January. It, it, it likes to mess with us and see how far it can turn the dial in the direction of cold during the winter. Yeah, my children were complaining around Christmas that it hadn't been cold in winter enough yet. And I was like, just wait. Just wait. Wait for January. Idaho has not hit its January and February stride yet. Well, in any case, to keep on going here, we'll move on to our next story here. Which is related to population. This comes by the Boise Dev by Autumn Robertson's. Idaho is living up to its name as a coveted destination. According to the Idaho Department of Labor, the state's population growth in 2023 was more than double the national average of 0.5%. As of July of 2023, the U.S. Census estimated Idaho's population at 1,964,726, making it a 1.3% increase from the same period in 2020. While Idaho's numerical growth ranked 17th and fell from its top 10 status, it still outpaced the national population growth rate. A significant 78% of Idaho's growth in 2023 was due to people moving to the state from other places, obviously, with 82% domestic, 18% international immigration. This is a notable increase from 2022 when the international immigration to Idaho was just 5%. The remaining 22% of Idaho's population growth comes from natural change. This is birth minus death and, you know, kind of the natural course of life there. Despite a slowdown in domestic migration from 2021, Idaho's estimated increase of 15,389 still places it in fourth in the percentage change. In contrast, the United States as a whole saw its population grow 335 million roughly, an increase of 1.6 million people. This is higher than the 0.4% growth rate in 2022 and the 0.2% in 2021. Interestingly, eight states saw their population decline from 2022 to 2023. As Idaho continues to attract new residents, the U.S. Census Bureau plans to release additional population estimates for the state in the spring. The Gem State's population surge underscores its growing appeal as a desirable place to live which hello we all did know that already it's wonderful we love it here it's awesome expected to see growth but it is interesting to and notable of course to see that we're seeing a decline um, kind of a little bit of a plateauing there it'll be interesting to see in that spring report that comes out if that continues yeah i can't say i'm surprised at this uh, there's there are enough people leaving enough other places that means we're we're just going to continue growing here Right, right. You're seeing that definitely reflected here in the numbers. But one thing I did want to point out and go into a little bit more in our discussion here was the international immigration stats, which I was a little surprised to see an 18% there and especially notable from 2022 when we only had that like 5% growth. The main bulk of those was 52% of that were Mexicans immigrating here to Idaho legally, of course. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. Interestingly, I'm going to have, see if you can guess, John, but what was the main county that saw the most amount of international or migration to? I mean, my first guess would be Ada, but if you're asking the question, that makes me think it's not Ada County. Would it be Canyon? No, y- your initial guess was correct. You, 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 okay. <laughs> you, you did yourself in there. Well, no, some, I, sometimes when these questions get asked, the, the obvious answer isn't the right one. So I was I was trying to... I was trying to outsmart you. Right? <laughs> but of the people coming here to Ada County, or not, I'm over in Canyon, but in Ada County, 500 were to be exact there. I don't know what the other numbers for the total amount is. I probably should have done that in my research, but I was up at like 11 doing this, and so 
Reason kind of goes out the window, but definitely interesting numbers to see and also expected with growth here in the gem state. And moving on to our next couple stories, now we'll be getting into some more stuff about the legislative session, mainly on bills that are just being reintroduced, that ones that we've heard about last year or we've already talked about. But our first one here is not one of those, so I'm going to take a little bit more time in our discussion to talk about it. Religious schools and state funding. This comes by KTVB7 by Laura Guido of Idaho Press. Representative Elena Price, a Republican from Coeur d'Alene, has reintroduced a proposal to repeal a section of Idaho's constitution known as the Blaine Amendment, which prohibits state funds from being allocated to religious institutions. The legislation, if passed, would remove the constitutional restriction on public funds going to any religious entity for any religious purpose, including supporting any educational institutions controlled by religious denominations. The process of the constitution Constitutional amendment requires a two-thirds majority in both the chamber and approval by Idaho voters. If the bill passes, the question will be put on the ballot in November. Price argues that recent U.S. Supreme Court rulings have rendered the Blaine Amendment null and void. These rulings originating in Montana and Maine stated that if states provide funds to private schools, religious schools must be also considered. The Blaine Amendment has been a target for those seeking to implement programs that would allow state funds to go towards private school tuition. Supporters of such legislation often prefer to send their children to private religious schools due to dissatisfaction with public schools. However, opponents argue that Idaho already has inadequate funds for its public schools and that these proposals would divert money into private and religious institutions that lack reporting requirements. Former Attorney General Jim Jones has been a vocal opponent of the moves to allow K-12 funding to go toward private schools. He argues that until the state adequately funds its public education system, it should not provide funding to private or church-sponsored schools. Which, first for context, the Blaine Amendment is present in 37 states' constitutions, including Idaho, of course, then referring to those Supreme Court cases that we referred about earlier in the story here. I went out and looked them up. In 2022, the Supreme Court ruled in Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue that the application of Montana's Blaine Amendment to exclude religious schools from its state scholarship program violated free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Also in 2022, for the second one, the Supreme Court further eroded the power of the Blaine Amendment's and Carson versus Mankin. The court ruled that the state could not permit families participating in education choice programs from choosing religious schools. These rulings marked a significant shift in the interpretation of the Blaine Amendments, suggesting that they couldn't be used to discriminate against religious institutions in the context of public funding. So that's why we're now where we're at with this bill kind of coming forward in the Idaho legislature in this session. Right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, so it brings up the, there's a couple things that I noted in this article that I wanted to point out. The first is from Attorney General, former Attorney General Jim Jones. He said that until the state adequately funds its public education system, well, currently we're going to close some of our schools in Nampa because kids are leaving those schools to go to schools that don't suck. So thing number one is more money doesn't equal better schools. This is right. this is where I think that having a free market for education makes way more sense than a publicly funded education system. Because in a free market system, those schools that succeed and have a good product, well, those ones will have more students sent to them. And then they'll be too big. And then they'll have to have offshoots or other campuses. And so if people are leaving the public education system, that doesn't mean we need to change the public education system. That means we need to look at what's working and do that instead. So that's the first thing. And I agree wholeheartedly with Jim Jones on that. The other thing that someone said. I disagree. Right. I agree with my disagreement of him. <laughs> I just thought I'd jump in there. <laughs> I, I approve that. So diverting money into private and religious institutions that lack reporting requirements. Well, here again, we're talking about, all right, so the public schools, they report their their what they do and they report how well they're doing and they're doing poorly. So you're going to say that the public institutions need to be able to report. Goodness gracious, I'm too tired for this. Your <laughs> private institutions need to be able to report in the same ways that the public institutions do. Awesome. But the private institutions actually have 
track records of success, whereas the public ones, they might have reporting, but they have track records of, of not success, of failure. And so uh, it's, it's hard to predict the future, but one of the ways you predict the future is by looking at the past. If something has always failed, then expecting it to succeed doesn't make sense. Right. One, your first point, I totally agree with that. He's like, well, we, we can't move on and we can't, we, we, why are we trying to divert these funds towards private education when the public education is just so lacking and has in- inadequate funding? And I'd be like, okay, f- fair. I, I guess you're trying to make a point there, but I'd argue it, it should be more about no, is there inadequate funding to the public education system because it's, the vast majority of Idahoans actually homeschool. I think I don't have the numbers with me right now, but like in the nation, Idaho has some of the highest homeschool rates, let alone from private school, right? Which is going to be an offshoot of that. And so I would argue that instead of sitting here and we can honestly see that, yeah, Idaho's public education system compared to the rest of the nation, even we really don't do very well. If you look at our scores in our public schools and stuff compared to other public schools in the nation. How about we just solve this problem altogether and just get rid of the ineffective thing, which is the public school and take those tax dollars, which I know some people out there would say, well, we shouldn't be taking tax dollars and putting those into schools. If we take some of that funds as a community and say, Hey, you school, you're doing good. We want to encourage education, which is a just and good thing and hand that money, but let's make sure we're handing it to the right things, which his argument is yeah let's keep funding a thing that doesn't work no let's let's take those funds and focus in on what really is working and what parents are going to like you mentioned and we talked about like a week or two ago nampa's closing a bunch of schools one because of funding issues and two just for lack of attendance you're not having students go there and so why try to gin up this funding for something that even parents don't seem to really be engaging in and then you know with your second point there the reporting requirements, that that drives me up the wall, personally, especially because here in Idaho, a lot of the families go and do standardized testing that is available and the parents pay for. And it's really helpful for parents, uh, especially with the homeschooling, because then you can get a good bird's eye view of how your, your student or your child is doing in their education, at what areas you need to focus on or grow in or whatever else. And then they take those and they regularly present those to the legislature And those numbers, if you go and look at them, they are consistently way, way, way better than anything the public school can boast. And so allowing for that funding, especially towards religious schools, if they're doing well, then why shouldn't we give the funding to a religious situation there? The only thing that I can see that would make me as a parent of homeschool children not want to accept government money is because with government money comes government strings. But that's on me, the individual, to accept where I want it or not. That doesn't mean that the government shouldn't be offering it. And if they want to offer it with strings attached, great. That makes sense. If you're going to if you're going to pay for something, you should expect a return on investment. I, I understand that. So I would agree that this is a step in the right direction. The government should have funds available for whoever wants them. Yeah, I mean, I didn't include it here in my notes, but you guys can go and do your own research. But originally this Blaine Amendment was kind of like an anti-Catholic thing that happened in the past, as best as I can find. That's kind of funny. I have <laughs> I have problems with, with the Catholic Church, but maybe for very different reasons than... More theological than its political stance at times. I was going to say, there those the issues I have with the Catholic Church are definitely theological, but right. Catholic schools do educate. So they, they were the main source of education for a long time in America and especially in Europe, and they've produced some pretty amazing thinkers, inventors, poets, and people have come out of the education system that the Catholic Church, through its funding and different systems has allowed to occur. And I think you would be remiss trying to curtail that. I I could see someone being like, well, we don't want the Catholic Church to get its claws too much and controlling representatives and different things and stuff. And okay, but blocking funding that could go to a Catholic school that's going to be way better than your public school, I I, I think that's just petty at that point. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. 
With that said, we'll move on to our next one here, which is Idaho lawmakers target AI generated explicit images with new bill. This comes with the East Idaho News by Rhett Nelson. As of the 2024 Idaho legislation session commences, a bipartisan effort is underway to address the growing concerns of sexually explicit AI-generated images, commonly known as deepfakes, spearheaded by Representative Bruce Skog, a Republican from Nampa, alongside Senator Kevin Cook, a Republican representative from Idaho Falls, and Representative Julie Young, a Republican representative from Blackfoot. The proposed legislation seeks to criminalize the creation and distribution of these images for both adults and children. Skog, who has encountered numerous disturbing sex abuse cases in his legal career, recognizes the urge needed to update existing pornography laws to encompass the latest technological advancements. The ease of producing AI-generated images poses a heightened risk of exploitation, and currently only four states have enacted laws against superimposing someone's likeness onto explicit content without consent. The primary focus of the bill is the protection of children. Idaho Falls Police Detective Jared Mendenhall, part of the state's Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, confirms the active investigation of cases involving minors and AI technology. The sophistication of deepfake technology now challenges the ability to discern real images from fabricated ones, leaving a gap in law enforcement's capacity to pursue these cases effectively. Scog's bill, which is still in the drafting stages, aims to eliminate the defense that AI-generated pornography images are not real children, thereby criminalizing such content. With support from fellow lawmakers and insight from law enforcement and legislative efforts in other states, Skog is determined to push the bill forward, emphasizing the government's role in curbing societal evils. The timeline for the bill's advancement remains uncertain, but the resolve to see it enacted is clear. Which, this is something I know with the content that I've been hearing and reports and different stuff has been talking about and it's kind of been in the buzz. I know here in Idaho, we haven't heard as much about that that I've seen in like the news cycle and stuff. I personally think this is a good thing. I could hear some on more of the libertarian side being like, this is bad. The the state's trying to get super involved in content and moderating it and what you do or don't do with it. But I think we really have to go back to basics and what the concept, you know, of explicit crimes or pornography, right? One, we don't want that to be in the hands of minor, which is a different issue. At least let's make the argument that only adults should be seeing that type of content. And then also, secondly, with this, trying to say that with sexual crimes, it is sometimes a physical thing, but a lot of the times it, it is more a mental thing that you are violating a person's emotional, their character, their stature. And stuff like this comes to the forefront of that. And it'll be interesting to see how people grapple with the morality and the different, I guess, doctrine and theology that is behind a type of bill like this. As as technology changes, we need to change the way that we define some things. And I can understand there being a desire for freedom and expression and that is a conversation that needs to be had. Someone does need to be does need to be pushing back on a lot of things. And and there should be someone playing devil's advocate at the very least, if not actually believing that things should be legal. But when we start talking about exploitation, when you talk about child pornography or using AI generated images based on someone else of that, man, things get things get really weird really fast. And it and it's not good, I don't think. So I applaud our legislatures for moving forward with this. Where it ends up, I don't know, but I agree that that like I said, as technology changes, we need to change the way that we look at certain things. Right. That with politics, part of doing good politics, I would argue, is that we're taking eternal principles of right, wrong, justice, right? And we're applying those to ever-changing circumstances that, you know, technology is always going to be advancing. Media is always going to be changing and developing, right, into different ways and forms that, you know, 50, 60 years down the road, I'm not going to be being able to imagine, right? but that we take these eternal principles of what we consider wrong and right, and then we try our best to then apply them. 
As for the wordage they're going to use in this, it will be interesting to see, like you said, the way that they're going to apply this. But I do think this is a step in the right direction, and it needs to happen sooner rather than later to at least have this discussion, let alone the bill getting passed. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. But with that said, we'll move on to our last story and definitely a fun one and one I had a lot of enjoyment researching and something I didn't know at all. Well, moving on to our last story here, Nuclear Bombs Effect, an Underheard Battle in Idaho. This comes by several sources. As many of us know or can remember, in the 1950s and 60s, the United States conducted above-ground atomic weapons tests in Nevada, the fallout of which affected several states, including Idaho. The Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, RECA, was established to compensate those exposed to radiation, but its coverage has been limited to parts of Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. Now, as the program nears its sunset date, there's a bipartisan push to strengthen RECA and expand its coverage to include Idaho and other affected states. U.S. Senators Mike Crapo of Idaho and Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico, along with U.S. Representatives Teresa Ledger Fernandez of New Mexico and Burgess Owens of Utah, have introduced legislation to strengthen RECA. Despite the Senate Judiciary Committee passing the legislation in December 2021, the updates to RECA were not included in the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, much to the disappointment of Senator Crapo and others. The fallout from the nuclear tests has had a significant impact on Idaho. In particular, Gem County, which received the third highest amount of fallout in the nation, according to a 1997 National Cancer Institute study. Tona Henderson, head of the Idaho Downwinders Organization, testified in a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing about the radiation-related illnesses in her community. The proposed amendments to RECA would extend the program for 19 years, expand the coverage area to include more potential victims, and expand the use of affidavits in determining eligibility claims. The fight for recognition and compensation for Idaho's downwinders continues, with advocates like Henderson urging Congress to pass the bills and correct the failing of the RECA. The impact of the nuclear tests is still felt today, with residents in areas like Chalice reporting higher rates of cancer. The struggle to understand and cope with the long-term ramifications of the government's decision to explode nuclear bombs above ground in the far west continues. The push for justice and compensation for Idaho's downwinders remains a critical issue. Which, originally, I came across this story in a new newsletter that I get emailed. It's about stuff in the Treasure Valley in Boise. I, and I have no doubt many of you, didn't have any idea that Idaho was hugely affected by the causes of fallout. For context, I actually went and found that study that they was referring to that was done by the National Cancer Institute. In particular, the one with the ranking, Jim County, the third in the nation for exposure from above ground nuclear tests done in Nevada. Now, when I heard that, I originally thought, well, what were the other ones? The second was Custer County, which is also in Idaho. And then for the first that had the most amount of fall on their ranking was, I think, what is it here? Meager County in Montana, which is interesting. I would have expected it closer to the explosions. But when we were doing research for this particular article, I learned that a lot of the times with like the fall, especially with above air ones, it doesn't happen like near the site as much. It oftentimes, especially with the fallout, it'll travel a distance and then fall. So you kind of have this weird zone. And so that zone seems to be with like Jim County and a bunch of different counties here in Idaho. Yeah, it's interesting that that we were so affected here. Living in New Mexico, I know they dropped the test one down in, in White Sands. But yeah, I, I had no idea that that so many places downwind of the explosion would be as impacted as they are. I mean, I, I guess it makes sense. Right. Which, quick question to see, hopefully John hasn't read ahead of here in the script, but of the top five counties exposed to fallout, how many of those do you think are in Idaho? Well, again, since you're asking the question, I'm guessing any number of them are. I would say three of them. Number one is that Montana one. The entire rest, the other four are all Idaho counties. Wow. It's also interesting that it's Montana, which is even further north and east from from where any detonations would have happened. Right. 
which, you know, coming from this, I was then curious, well, how much exposure was it? And so in those top five counties, they gave it kind of a bracket. The range of radiation exposure was between 12 to 16 rads. To give kind of some context for that, the average person in the U.S. is annually exposed to 620 millireams. But then doing some fancy math, one rad is equivalent to 10,000 millirems. So the people in these counties had a radiation exposure approximately 193 to 258 times greater than the average annual radiation dose received by people in the United States. I mean, that's significant one way or the other. Yeah, when I, I when I first saw the rad ratings, I'm like, oh yeah, 12 to 16 rads, you know, because I'm not a nuclear scientist that's looking at those numbers all the time. And then when I did this, you know, little bit of some math and stuff, which you're welcome to go do that for yourself, I was like, oh, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah this this isn't this isn't playing around amounts of radiation. This is that's considerable. The other point I wanted to point out kind of in our discussion is that, you know, obviously when you see that amount of radiation, you kind of might wonder why weren't we originally in the RECA grant that was made. Firstly, when I went and looked out, the reason for it that the bill was passed was it was aimed at helping and apologizing for those that were directly involved and around the test sites. So, you know, different nuclear technicians, the mines that Mm, mine the uranium and stuff. So because of that, a lot of that funding was going to places like INEL, a couple of mines. Some of that funding from the RECA did go to people here in Idaho, but it was usually due to people that were directly involved with the project, directly involved in the mining, the testing, whatever else, and nearer to the sites rather than the areas that then got the fallout. As for why it wasn't expanded, I went out and did a little bit of research also on that. The best answer I could find, I think, comes from Mitch McConnell, who, if you remember correctly, there was the big like spending defense budget that was done towards the end of the year in December that got passed or whatever, but there was a bit of contention because obviously right now our government, especially with the Republican wing of it, which I am in support of, doesn't want to be spending more money than we have to because, you know, runaway inflation and uh, a lot of other deficits. But Mitch McConnell's main thing was saying that, quote, it was a budget buster and a unfunded mandate. And so basically Hmm. what ended up happening is it got caught up in some of the budget cuts for the uh, uh, 2023 NDA, a um, project that was at the end of the year. Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, I I can understand that. I don't know. I I guess one question I would have is, all right, so... This this is a thing that happened how many years ago? Uh, right. You know, so this exposure started in the 60s. There was a test. Was it in 90? 90... 1990-something. Right. So the 90... It, it, yeah, the National right Cancer Institute study happened in 97. So that's what? 20 years ago now? 25? 26? 27 years ago because it's 24 now. Goodness gracious. So that study was done 20, ah. 24 years ago. No, 27 years ago. And that information has been public knowledge for how long that these areas are, that that they experience a higher level of radiation. So at this point, it's kind of a, well, if you're still living there, that's kind of your own damn fault. I understand moving is hard, but as someone who's moved, you just kind of do. And when you stay there, you're you're making a choice to stay there. And if that's a part of your decision matrix, well, then you you are accepting a higher likelihood of having cancer. If you live in the Midwest, you should expect tornadoes. That's part of signing up of living in the Midwest. Exactly. Now, should we also help people whose whose lives are turned upside down by tornadoes? Y- yes. Yes, we should. But also, should those people have some tornado insurance? Probably. Like, the, these things go together. Right. I, we... I, there's there's this there's a problem where we even as conservatives it's the compassionate thing to do to help people and i agree with that full full throatedly yes it's compassionate to help people but humans have personal responsibility and we cannot also say on one hand it's compassionate to help me help people but on the other we must rely on the government to help us for these things, because I'm going to give up my personal responsibility here. So I, I don't, I don't know. I kind of go both ways on this one. I, I can see why 
we should help, but also personal responsibility has to be a thing. And we cannot rely on our government to save us. Right, right. That we, we don't want government to be our God in our lives, right? We want it to obviously protect. That's one of the roles of government, but it doesn't need to overreach too far. Also, in a Christian nation, we do have, like you're talking about, and especially with conservatives, because we ended up being in more of that Christian end of things, a loving, compassionate, wanting to help others, right? Uh-huh. But there also becomes a realistic point of, okay, yeah, you know, live with the consequences of those actions and be aware of them. And then you have to live with that. And the only counter I could hear to that, and this is definitely, you know, an issue that's delicate off the top of my head. I can only think of maybe a couple solutions, but the counter I think is a pretty good one, which is that you live in Idaho, right, John? Mm -hmm. Did you know about those risks of living in Gem County and Lemhi County? I didn't. No. And so the person could make the argument is that, okay, say the government doesn't want to fund, you know, obviously trying to spend more money and they got cut from the NDAA bill that came out at the end of the year. But people should at least then be well informed of what they're signing up to living in those areas. Yeah. That's the one counter I could hear. Yeah. And I, and I understand that. I understand that counter. And, and so that's where, that's where... Compared to tornadoes where people know there's tornadoes in the Midwest. Right. And it's an understood thing you're signing up for. Yeah. And and New Orleans is half underwater anyway. And so if you're going to live there, expect at some point to uh, need to swim. I wonder if part of the original NDAA, or I guess that's the National Defense, the part of the original, the, the RECA, R-E-C-A, part of that original legislation should have been to educate people in areas with high radiation to inform the population. Because it makes sense to me, you know, even looking back at COVID, if the government directly harms people by the choices that they make, the government should be directly responsible for helping to remediate that harm, right? And so this, it would make sense originally during the, you know, when we first found out like, oh no, there was lots of radiation exposure. That's really bad. Here, we now need to directly help the people that we directly hurt. Okay. Now that we've done that, right. part of part of that directly helping people is an education program to all of the people that live in that area and the rest of the United States to be like, hey, by the way, this was a problem. And so know that that area has these issues. There you go. Because then, then people would know that, right? And I don't know. Maybe there should be, there should be something on city websites to be like, yes, and oh, by the way, this city also was exposed to this. I don't know, right? Because we want to, in- yeah, because we want to inform people so that have we an can, be, yeah, so that we, can, yeah, we want to have an informed populace so that we can make informed decisions and take personal responsibility. But to do that, you're right. You need to know things. And I didn't know things. Now I know things. Right. Which, you know, on the flip side, you know, I don't know how much of this still is affecting Jim County yeah. after, you know, the bombs were dropped there in the 50s and the 60s. So, you know, if you're living in Jim, I wouldn't freak out too much. You're, I you know, I think people often forget that they're regularly being exposed to radiation. Uh-huh. It's a thing that's regularly happening throughout your life. Like we said, there's an average amount of exposure. I don't know how much those are in those areas, but yeah, you might pause for thought next time you have a cherry at the cherry festival about the history of Jim County and kind of some of the things that have happened in America's history and maybe share this with someone who didn't know it. Cause I didn't know it for sure at all. And we'll probably most definitely make this into a short or at least a YouTube video down the line that you can share with friends and family. But in any case, let's wrap it up. Thank you for listening to the entire podcast. I sincerely hope you found it enjoyable and valuable. If we missed any important points or provided incorrect information, please feel free to reach out to us via email at localyokelhidaho2022 at gmail.com or on Twitter by tweeting us at localyokelidaho. With the small team we have here, we're not able to cover everything, but we do our best to cover the most interesting and important stories. Thank you for your continued support and assistance. That's all for now, and I wish you a fantastic rest of your week. Godspeed.